and welcome to the Doofcast, the official variety podcast of doofmedia.com. My name is Scott Daly, and this is my younger slash older brother, Matt Freeman. Matt, uh, which game are you watching? Oh, you know, just checking out game 93,531. Oh, is that the the one with the... Yeah, the, the ball lights itself on fire every uh, 43 minutes. Who's winning? Uh, the ball. This week on the show, it's another one of our patron-produced episodes. Folks who pledge to us at the Do For Year level or above on Patreon, that's patreon.com slash doofmedia, get to select a movie or a short story for us to do a show on. This week, patron Josh has asked us to take a look at the 2017 web serial web story thingy. Web fiction-y thing. Called 17776. Um, I think you had read this before, right? Yes, I had. Yeah, and, and this was all new to me, so um, it's always fun when you, we get to do a show on something that we don't normally talk about. We're mostly a movie slash TV show podcast. We occasionally do like short fiction or web comics or or stuff like this. So uh, it's always fun to do something a little bit different. So I'm looking forward to this conversation a whole bunch. Yeah, me too. Me too. And then after we talk about seventeen seven seventy six, we are going to circle back around to last week's episode and talk about the results of our Council of Doof vote on Mad Max Fury Road. And then lastly, we're going to talk about movie theaters, Matt, because they're coming back. Are they? But but should they? <laughs> for, for a little while, at least they are. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that, and then that'll pretty much do it for this week's episode. So cool. Let's go ahead and just jump right into the main topic of the week and talk about 1700, 17770. I keep wanting to do it like correctly, you know, because it's like Uh technically Uh 17,776. But that's not how if 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 we make it that long in years, would we do that? I don't I don't know. I don't Uh, know. I mean, maybe that's a good place to start, which is that (laughs) like I think it's I think that's like a perfect name for it actually because mm-hmm. the implication is we've just continued to add numbers to the calendar with no like no calendars ever lasted 10,000 years obviously right 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 um but the implication is that in this story the calendar has lasted 15,000 years with no alterations because people just like the way it is <laughs> yeah which is i mean which is true of everything that's happening in this uh-huh, exactly in this story so yeah this is a um it is a story written by john boys is that how you pronounce his name i mean I'm i think sure. that's how you pronounce it in english sure i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure it has another pronunciation um he is a a right a sports writer he's actually created director at the website sb nation um which is where this story was originally published um he apparently he was working on it for over a year but it ran from july 5th through 15th in 2017 um and the concept of this thing is what is football of the future going to look like and by the future they mean very far into the future the year 17776 um yeah. and I, I like there's there's a lot to talk about here, Matt, because there's so much going on in this yeah. story. Um, it's doing a whole lot of things, and I think it's doing it very cleverly. So I think I think maybe the the first thing is, did you did you like it? <laughs> I thought it was great. In fact, I liked it even more this time because the first time you read it, you're so disoriented, especially toward the beginning, that a lot of your enjoyment is just like this is wacky. Um, but you're not really necessarily picking everything up. But since this is the sec- second time that I read it, I, I knew what was going on from the beginning and was able to more appreciate, you know, what he is doing with this story, what he's doing with these um, with this premise, I guess. I think that's one of the most fun things about it is the premise is just so inventive. Um, and then he carries that premise, uh, you know, all not, not as far as it can go, but you know, it, it to very satisfying extents in many different directions. Yeah, I mean, it, it ends up being this thing that, like, I think one of the main ideas is talking about is like why sports, right? I think that's the main the main theme of this thing is why do people get so invested into sports? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of the things this thing is trying to examine and and you know reason with. But it goes far, far beyond that. It talks about the nature of existence, the nature, like what drives humans. How, why do we behave the way we behave? Who are we? What would change? In, what would change in the future? What would happen if death stopped being a thing for us? I mean, mm-hmm. and it gets into all these really fascinating topics, and it does so in a way that like 
always um, it's always interesting. It always makes sense. This is kind of a very quick read. I think it took me just a couple of hours. And I mean, it's just like you never kind of know where it's going to zig or zag to. Um, but it is always interesting. Um, and I think yeah. that the, the, our three main characters are such wonderful little characters that just help like take what is basically a, a story of exposition of explaining what life is like in this year um, and help make it like help carry you through it. I think a lot. I, I liked it a whole bunch. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. The, the, the characters, the three space probes, interestingly keep you grounded, mm-hmm. even though it's such a, <laughs> it's such a crazy idea that these are three sentient space probes um, that have become sentient after just receiving radio signals for thousands of years. Um, th- like, one of them is like the the big sister mentor and then one is like the wacky one and then one is the uh you know the uh the newcomer the um yeah the fish out of water the the person who is who is your you know vicarious vessel that you're being educated about it uh in, into the world right. via um i think that's a brilliant way of doing it and also like I don't know. There's just, there's so many things about it that are clever. Like just the fact that like, yeah, it's super, super far in the future, but everything is exactly the same is it like, it makes it very easy for you to latch onto and, and point at just the things that are, that are, that he's trying to say specifically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it allows it, it allows, I mean, like we talk about science fiction and we talk about science fiction as a tool to teach us about our world. That is its primary purpose mm-hmm. in my mind. Like we use these far off places or planets or times or concepts in order to like shed some light on the things that exist in our world um, and, and teach us about ourselves. And I think that's what this is literally doing via basically recreating our world in every way except for oh by the way people can't die or get hurt anymore yeah and there are no children um and that'll that really allows him to zoom in on exactly what he wants to talk about which is kind of which is games which is entertainment yeah. which is how society is reflected by its entertainment um yeah. which is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart um he's of course writing it through the lens of sports um which makes sense because he is a sports writer but I mean, I think you could substitute this for just about any other kind of entertainment, right? Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's perfectly perfectly true. I mean, um, I think I think you could go through each of these sort of parts of the story. As as I reckon it, there's about there's about six different movements of the story, and you could mm-hmm. you could talk about like, okay, this is the part of the story where our main character space probe is kind of reckoning with this facet of uh, of human of humanity you know but like you said it's not about it's not about the, the wild and wacky premise so much as it is about humanity um like for the you know you've got you've got like a game of football that's been deadlocked in like a gorge for like thirteen thousand years and 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 the the character struggles with like wh- why why would they do this like that this has broken them like that they're mm-hmm. they're the, the immortality has, dri- has driven them insane which is like one side of the argument and then the other space probes are like well you could you could view it that way but also like how is this really any different from you know the norm or right, like right. Hey, hey at least they're doing something you know um and uh you know there's i i could go through i could really go through each of them but i want to i kind of want it to be more of a, a back and forth as we talk about these different stories no i mean i i think i think this is a great kind of strategy to take with this thing is to go through each of these stories um Mm -hmm. and i think you know if we're going to start with that one i think the thing that i like you know we we talked very briefly about juice and nine and ten i think the thing that i love most about nine is that yes he's a he's a sentient space probe hurtling through space thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away from earth but he is also because he is just kind of a a collection of signals He's basically a human. And, mm-hmm. and so his reaction, like not only is he our surrogate character for like the excuse to be told all this stuff, but he is our surrogate character in that he is in essence a human being that existed in about 2000 and whatever. Right. Like, yeah, that that, that is his point of view. And therefore, like he reacts in the way that we would react to this kind of thing where you hear about these two teams just like is stuck in this gorge for 1300 years and the 21st century human brain says that's the most absurd thing i've ever heard of like that's why why would you couldn't couldn't there be 
a, a infinite amount of better things you could be doing with your time. And the the other characters arguments are no. <laughs> yeah. Or, 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 or <laughs> could, like, could there be like, uh, you know, I, I like I like the I like one thing that they said, which was like, well, I mean, they know that they're going to have forever. So why not just do this until it's done? Yeah, like that. That that was one of the things that actually kept coming up in the story over and over that I thought was kind of great. Is like you you had characters that are sort of committed to something that have been committed to that thing for many times longer than any human has ever been alive, Mm -hmm. and it becomes this huge, this huge thing for them. Like like you can believe that if you played, imagine if you played one single game for even your entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. Um that would have such emotional weight to you. And like the idea of losing would be so, so crushing. Um, even if you knew that, okay, yeah, you get, you get to keep living on and on and on and on afterward, that would be your whole world. And then, mm-hmm. you know, we, we have like the character who spent, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years collecting all these footballs and then they all get destroyed and they're just like, obviously really messed up about it. Um, we have yeah. the dude who's been hiding in, in, in the, uh, the end zone of the enemy team for like 9,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, because if he hides in their end zone for 10,000 years, they'll win the game. Yeah. And it's like the level of commitment is, it, it's, it's it, yeah. I mean, it's all, it's very fun for me to think about because I like to think about like, like, you know, ending, ending the, the mortal lifespan of humans and just not having to think about that anymore. So it definitely pushes you to think about these things in a, in a lot of different ways. Yeah. I mean, I, I think this is one of the best depictions of how, a human being would react to the concept of forever that I've ever seen in storytelling. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's, there's some other good ones, but I mean, really like we do a very bad job, like getting our brains around what eternity actually is because it's a concept that just does not exist for us. And in Mm -hmm. no, like we are by our very nature mortal. (laughs) And so like, like we can't like, even 15,000 years, which you're right, is, is, is infinite, like is basically might as well be infinitely longer than any of us will ever live is nothing. It's nothing mm-hmm. compared to eternity. It's yeah. a, it's a, a one tiny speck of a grain compared to what eternity is. And, and so, I mean, I think like, obviously the author chose this year for a few reasons, but I, I think 15,000 years roughly into the future is enough time where our characters have really started to get used to this idea. Right. Like, uh-huh. but they, I, I think, I think like, cause if you, if you went 3 million years into the future, right. I think it would be a very different story. Um, I, I actually kind of curious, but what, what this, this race would look like 3 million years in the future, would it just be the same? Would we just be going through the yeah. same stuff? But 15,000 15, years is so long, but I think it's, it's, like it, it's it's long enough to where people have like gotten their head around what living forever is going to be and have started to map their behavior to that, but not long enough to where they're like driven just completely insane, which I feel like might would would maybe happen. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because like I I love the story for what it is, but I personally don't really necessarily agree with the way that it portrays how humans would react, and I think that's fine. Um, it's fine to just like ha- have your reactions to art, and and maybe you. It, like like first of all he's he's being a bit comedic with a lot of the things that he's doing like sure i don't know if if this guy actually really thinks that people would play the same football game for ten thousand years or whatever like i i, I just I think, don't i don't think so but I, I think i think people would get bored is the thing but mm-hmm. i like and, and that's um i guess this is maybe like editorializing beyond what the story is actually saying but like the thesis of the story is basically like People actually did invent cool technology, but they liked things to be the way they liked them. And so they just made everything look like it looked in the in the early 21st century. Yeah, yeah. And then they kept it that way forever, even even though they had presumably at, at some point actually invented like a high tech civilization. And then they just kind of like turned it all off and, and took it back to normal so that they could uh, feel comfortable. And I, and I think like, okay, that's a, that's a very interesting thing to say about humanity. And that's, that's a very like stylized way of making a point about the way humans are and the the way we're creatures of habit, but we're also super duper not creatures of habit. (laughs) Um, we're, we're all, we also get bored really quickly and Mm -hmm. we can't stop ourselves from trying to innovate and compete and, and one up each other. 
um, like like there, that. This is not a complete picture of humanity. It's not trying to be a complete picture of humanity. It's trying to focus on and caricature this one sort of tendency of humanity. Um, talking about we like our creature comforts. We like uh, we like predictable things, and we like to busy ourselves with something that feels meaningful when there's no other meaning to be had. And I think it works perfectly in in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the argument here to me is, and and I I'm not saying I disagree with you, but I think the the birth and growth of humans is part of what spurs that stuff on. I mm-hmm. think. I mean, I think that like a very a very natural cycle is you know the the older generation getting older and um, the newer generation wanting to push forward and do new things. Like the the status quo is not quo to Mm -hmm. to young people because they haven't they've never learned it that way and so i think i think that the the stasis of everything was an exploration of what happens if there are no more children if there's if 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 the old people don't are the only generation that 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 there's nothing else that there's no new people being created that there's no new ideas being injected into a system and it's just a bunch of old people um who have gotten used to things the way they are and and there's no and and, and I agree with you I don't think that like humanity across the board would behave in that cert- certain way but I do think it's like a it's like a it's taking the concept of the older generation is stuck in their ways. The newer generation is what pushes us forward. It's taking that concept and then saying, okay, let's throw that 15,000 yeah. years into the future. Yeah. Let's, let's science fictionize that. You're right. exactly right. And the story, the story does, does hammer that point in when, mm-hmm. you know, the space probes are basically saying like, Hey, look at this strip of our office park where like nobody ever walks in this, this strip of, of office park because, yeah because they have no reason to, they have no drive to explore and they have no practical reason to, and thus no one would ever go there. Mm -hmm. But a child would go there just to do it, just, just for no reason, just to explore. And, and the idea that it is the young who drive exploration and innovation and maybe even competition, I think is, uh, you know, that's textual that's in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think think that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I do think that's fascinating. Just that, that general concept. And, and Mm -hmm. yeah, like you, I'm not sure if I a hundred percent agree with it all, but I also am, finding myself an aging man who is <laughs> looking at the younger generation and just going like, but why are you doing that? <laughs> and uh-huh. I, I feel myself getting older because I feel every day looking at, looking at Gen Z and just being like, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing that for? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a weird, it's a weird time sure. in my life to have read the story um, with that yeah. particular motif in mind. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because like us sitting here talking about it, like when I was reading the story, I was actually mostly just like, oh, this is so entertaining. This is so clever. This is so fresh and original. Um, but like all, all of these themes and, and thoughts and ideas are like soaking in and bouncing around your head. And, and I, I almost wasn't expect to be having this kind of conversation with you about it. I was expecting us to talk more about like the format or you know, the, the execution in certain ways, mm-hmm. but like I, I, we're talking mostly about the ideas. I th- actually think that's great. Yeah. Um, I think that just speaks to how successful this thing is. I mean, I definitely want to talk to you about the format because yes. I think it's, it's incredible, but uh, yeah, I mean the things that stuck with me, I, I think I read this on Monday and the things that stuck with me after that read through were the ideas were mm-hmm. just like what this thing is exploring and what it's saying. Um, and I just find it infinitely fascinating and you're absolutely right. It is, it is infinitely entertaining. I laughed at juice like constantly. Constantly. Juice is hilarious. Yeah. Um, and it's the exact kind of kind of humor that I really enjoy. Um, mm. And I thought that was great. But yeah, yeah, I mean, there's yeah. there's so much there's so much stuff going on here. Right. I, I just I just think the cleverest maybe choice about the whole thing is that it is broken up into these kind of sub stories. Like, yeah. I think my favorite a favorite story was when we just zip on over to I forget all the characters names, but we zip on over to the woman who has been playing the 500 game for for uh, I don't I don't remember a huge a huge, a huge amount of time, yeah. she's never scored any points, and it's it's actually statistically incredibly unlikely that she would have never scored any points. And like she's she's a celebrity because of it, and she has kind of a complex about it now. Um, but she's like kind of a delightful, charming human being, mm-hmm. and and then she's finally gonna get it. The 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 ball is finally flying toward her, and you're like, oh, this is this is great, but you know something is wrong. 
because you saw the way the space probes were reacting in the previous chapter yeah. when we saw where the ball was headed. And at first you're like, so what's funny is I had forgotten what happens. So I was like, oh, is it, are they upset that she's going to get the ball and she's going to end her streak of not having the ball? <laughs> and then it turns out, no, it's, it's going to destroy this, this one remaining thing in the world that, that is actually like special. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, and it like, it's this, it's this very great kind of short story. We don't even really get to see, uh, the woman's reaction to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like, well, that's the crazy thing is like the entire time this thing is hurtling through the air, we're seeing her reaction to it and her mm -hmm. reaction to her celebrity coming to an end. The reason she's special, the, the purpose that she had given herself was I'm going to keep doing this and I'm never going to get it. Hey, yuck. And that's like, that's mm -hmm. become, everything to her mm -hmm. um and and suddenly that the like it, it to me <laughs> not to get too crazy with it but it's like it's like the red Sox not winning the world series it's like mm -hmm. it, it was just this thing for like so long that they just never won the world series they just never ever ever won and then they finally did and then that's over and then uh -huh. they've won it like twice more since then i think but it's just like oh Okay. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Right. I guess that's done. And the same thing, the Cubs, the Cubs <laughs> just recently won the world series for the first time ever. Um, and it's, it's just like the idea of the person, the, the team or the person that never wins and it just becomes the thing. And you all mm -hmm. want to see them win. Like you want the Red Sox to break the curse. You want to see the Cubs win their first world series ever, but then it happens and it's over. And, and that was like, and and then you're just another baseball team. You're mm -hmm. just another competitor. Like, yeah, what made you unique? What made you special in the world is now gone. And there's a this weird like sadness to that. I think, and I, I do think that that's what this was kind of exploring. And yeah, yeah. And I think that ties in so wonderfully with the bulb too, because that it's just this inanimate thing that was given purpose just because it was this thing that lasted. Um, when it shouldn't have. Um, mm -hmm. and so it's attached so much purpose to, like there, there was no reason this thing should have, should have stayed lit as for as long as it has, just like there's no reason she shouldn't have caught a freaking thing by now. And these two events happen that, that ne these two events that change a thing that never should have happened in the first place, um, happen simultaneously. Yeah. And well, it, it, yeah, it's beautiful. It's mm -hmm. beautiful. It, it parallels the, the breaking of the light to the breaking of her streak, if mm -hmm. you will, yeah. her, her losing streak. Exactly, yeah. Um, these, are, these are basically things that had value, in a sense. They, they, I mean, her, her losing streak had value to her. Yeah. And it's so interesting that such an ephemeral, constructed, fake thing can have value. And, and it does. I yeah. mean, I, I think you're exactly right that, like, when, 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 a, you know, when a team breaks a streak like that, you're, you're like, oh, like, something, something magical stopped just just then mm -hmm. um yeah I, I love that i mean i'm not that into sports but I, even i can 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 like relate to um the feeling of this kind of thing yeah it is great it's, it's, great. it's really powerful and um like i just i love that we're introduced to this woman which she's ordering food at a fast food restaurant and just like yeah. bitching about the horrible tasting fast food they got which is uh -huh. which is which is both like completely centers the character in our world because like that's what people do all the time and also shows this like nobody gives a shit like I I, yeah. I do you want some money with your order I think was one of my favorite lines yeah the thing. right and and like they basically she's just like oh I don't have any change okay just give me twenty twenty seven fifty and then she gives her seven fifty back mm -hmm. and it's like yeah they're just they're just doing it because it's something to pass the time basically yeah. I think that that was something that I noticed definitely more on this read through is like. Um, the implication that these space probes are really obsessed with football, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that everybody in the whole world is this obsessed with football. It's more like, um, everybody in the whole world has found some way of making the monotony endurable. Sure. And sure. some, some subculture of them have done this thing where they turn football into this ridiculous, uh, uh, you know, explosion of different games and but some people are just uh, sitting at the fast food restaurant making fast food, even though there's absolutely no need to do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, th they think they said the nanos feed them if they need food. Yeah. Right. Because like, that's the guy sitting in the that's been hiding yeah. for 10,000 years. He's they'd bring him food. 
yeah, the nanos will feed you. It, and, and, you know, the, the guy pretending to be, or the guy decided he was a cop and told them not to chase the tornado. <laughs> it's like, there's no need for cops. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so um, wonderful. Yeah. Like, I, and, and we're I, the way in which he introduces us to these rules are, is so fascinating because like the tornado thing happens before we understand the, the bounds of the world. Right. So we're mm-hmm. seeing this woman run into a tornado and we don't know what that means. And we're just like, uh, what? And then yeah. like, and then, yeah, like we don't get it yet. And I think that's such a, a really clever way of doing it. We, he kind of really throws us in and we kind of have to put it together as we go. Yeah. It's great. Uh, I love it. Um, let's talk that's... about the Broncos and Steelers. <laughs> Yeah, that's fun. Um, so this is, I, I forget which number, I don't remember any of the numbers, but basically the concept is they were two teams playing a football game and they they ruleified each other so much that people like claimed pieces of the field and then no one's even playing football anymore and we're just hanging out on the field. Like there's a store, yeah. there's houses. Um, yeah. San Francisco yeah. decided to get it on the action so the 49ers have a little bit too. <laughs> Um, the ball is somewhere in there, but no one's actually playing. I, I, this is, and this is the one I had the hardest time of trying to like. Okay, what what is he going for with this metaphor? Um, mm-hmm. And I had the hardest time, I, and I'm not sure I've got there. So I'm curious what you think. Well, I'll just I'll just kind of go in a direction and see where it takes us. Sure, I guess. Sure. So 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 clearly, this is the one out of all of them that is most fixated on this idea that you give you give a you give a group of humans a bunch of rules and a lot of time and an ability to modify the rules and they'll just keep modifying and modifying and modifying yeah. until they've created some kind of like, like it reminded me like the word Byzantine springs to mind. Like it reminded me of, of like the court of the mandarins or something where mm-hmm. like this super ancient and complex culture has built up over, over the eons. Um, and you know, or, or like that one city in like Europe where, like it's like I don't even remember if this is a true thing or a fictional thing actually, but like basically anywhere that humans have been around for a super long time, you get these incredibly intricate rule sets, mm-hmm. like a like 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 the governorship of the Vatican and stuff like this. Anyway, um, that's what it reminded me of, and 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 so I'm like, okay, this is just this idea that um, I guess I guess the human beings like things the way they like them, but also at the same time. Uh, if you give them enough rope, they will create monstrosities like this. I didn't quite get, honestly. I'm not. I don't feel satisfied with any of the stuff I'm saying. And what I didn't get was like they try to make this connection to like this being capitalism somehow. And I'm like, what? No, huh? <laughs> I mean, it, it to me, it just strikes as government, right? I mean, like it, uh-huh. it's funny because they're doing a thing where they're sp- he's specifically making fun of how complex sports rules have gotten, like the rules of football are just insane now. Like the, the, yeah. the minutia and the detail of what you can do and when you can't do it. And what's the exception to that are just absurd. And so it's kind of playing off that. But I do think, you know, what you said really made me think like, this is just kind of what happens in any rule system, including mm-hmm. a governmental one. This is basically a mini, uh, mini country that's existing on this field yes. and they have no purpose there's no overarching goal anymore. It's just they're just existing and they're just trying to coexist with each other while squabbling. I mean, I guess like maybe even mini country is not enough. Maybe this is just like a mini earth here where mm-hmm. everyone has their own territory. And yeah, at some point we were competing for something, but we don't remember why. Um, mm-hmm. I, I the, the capitalism angle didn't like I, I agree with you didn't jump. out. I mean, I guess like just like the idea of of um wanting space like the the idea of just seeing this open field that wasn't owned by anyone and just saying we must all have we must all declare and own space i think maybe that's the capitalism critique that's going on there i guess i i guess but see like what's what's funny is the characters like the the space probes sort of found it like horrifying in some way and i just thought it was great i was like (laughs) yeah this is this is what humans are like we we are this creature that if you give us a, a you know fifty five by one hundred yard rectangle, um, we will turn it into this crazy zany playground with skyscrapers and walls and statues and stores and and um, we will make it vibrant and awesome and something that you never could have 
predicted. Like, what, what's the what's the critique here? I'm it's not, boring. It's, just, it's well, I mean, that's that's kind of what they like. They didn't want to watch it because it's nothing. There's nothing because there's nothing happening. Well, ironically, I maybe ironically is not the right word, but I I just disagree. Not it, it's not football. <laughs> it's not football anymore. That's true. But that's that's like saying that human human civilization is boring because we don't have to fight each other for food using spears anymore. Like, yeah, it's a, we have elevated the game. Now the game is, um, it's it's more it's a uh, it's it's Sim City. It's not football anymore. Mm-hmm. It's a different game now, and and that's something we do all the time. We turn we turn one game into another game. You know, we we turn things that aren't games into games. And and we we make meta games out of games that are that become stale. I think this is all fine and normal and even even good. Like like that that's okay. Just to, like to be honest, this, this is something that never quite sat right with me. And maybe you can straighten this out for me. So sure. The whole the whole story is thematically about everything's in stasis. The cars are the same cars. The houses are the same buildings. People dress basically the same. They just sort of rotate out like skinny jeans and, and flannel and stuff. But the rules of the football games have exploded into this incredibly insane variety. So that is clearly not in stasis. That is clearly uh, uh, innovating and evolving and people are, are being creative and um, keeping their minds alive in that way. So is there, is there a conflict? It, like it, it strikes me as a conflict, but am I, maybe I'm not looking at it correctly. I, I think, I think that is supposed to represent the importance that we place on our entertainment that that everything else i don't care i don't care about my pants i don't care about what my house looks like i don't care about advancements in technology you get me to a certain point where i'm comfortable and i stop caring all i want is to have fun all i want is something to entertain me and so i'm those those are the things i care about the innovation and i don't know but it's like to me most of the games aren't even innovation. It's just like football, but bigger. It's just big <laughs> football. <laughs> how about this? How about football, but but long? Yeah, but like really long, and just absurdly long because time doesn't matter anymore. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's just we place our priority like. Like right now, there are not every American, obviously, but uh, there's a lot of Americans that don't give a shit about anything but football. Um, uh-huh. and, and I think it's also ironic that we're reading this right now in a time where sports don't exist anymore, where the basketball season was canceled. Baseball season never started up again. We're talking about the football season. It might happen. It might not. Um, some of the a bunch of a bunch of football players have tested positive for coronavirus. So. I, I don't fucking know, man. I don't know what's going to mm-hmm. happen. Um, but there are people that like this is football season is like the most important part of the year to them. And that's what they care about. And they're very invested in the numbers and the stats and the rules and 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 in making sure that the game is protected and changed for the better going forward. And and it strikes me is that this is a society of that, of all, mm-hmm. of only that, of you strip everything else away, you strip the the competitive need, you strip the idea of um, limited resources away, you strip the idea of of time as a limited resource away, and and it's just a society of just that, of just people who care about entertainment, and it's exploring the idea if if there is something wrong with that, is, is that, is that inherently bad? Is, is the fact that w- there's a, people out there who give a shit about football a good thing. And I think it's, it's so fascinating to me coming from a sports writer, coming from someone who spends most of their, uh, their career writing about these games. Um, Mm -hmm. because I mean, I I don't think the conclusion of the story is that no, it's bad that this is happening, that, Mm -hmm. that it's bad that this is what life is for these people. Now this is bad. Well, it's like, it's, what are you going to do? Like, what, like, like, I think that's the, the, (laughs) the genuine question that they were trying to ask nine. It's like, well, what do you, what do you want people to do? What what should mm-hmm. they be doing? If if, if human beings are going to live forever now, what what is the right thing to do right mm-hmm. now? And I don't I don't know. I I, I kind of took your question and went like that's w- crazy with it, but um that's that's that's, that's why I think you're seeing that disconnect. I I think I think it's just where people are placing their concern. 
I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I, it, th this is surprisingly like the most deep and wide ranging philosophical doof cast of all time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, that's, that's, that's really cool. I'm actually just kind of processing, you know, one, one thing that popped in my head while you were talking is, is, you know, you, I was thinking like one thing about me is I just have never really been into football. Like maybe brief periods in college when just like our, our college was really crazy about football mm -hmm. and it was sort of impossible to not care at all about football. And so that's like the most I ever cared. And that was not very much by the standard of, of like Americans. Um, so this is not something I really care about, not something that really hits me in the feels. And, and so I was like, well, what if this had been a story about something I do care about? Sure. What if, what, what if, what if these characters, instead of playing football, were like reading books <laughs> for, for 15,000 years? Right, right. What if, like, there, what if there's been a debate about whether Taylor was right <laughs> for 12,000 years? <laughs> yeah, and uh, it, like it, it's it's interesting because I can't easily just kind of simulate what, what that story would be. But I'm, mm -hmm. I'm tr what I'm trying to get at, I think, is is the idea that like it might feel different if the story kind of seemed to be uh, taking shots at something that was really important to me. And I don't think it, it I, I think you're right. I don't think the story is taking shots at people who like football. I yeah, think it's more yeah. saying like, look, like man, humans are the animal that plays. Uh -huh. And yeah. if you take away all of their material concerns, that's kind of all they have left and you really can't begrudge them that. And maybe there is a kind of like existential terror to it when you think about it, but also, also it's probably fine. You know, I, I don't know, like, okay. Unless you had another thing to say on that topic. I, I, no, no, no. I, Go for slight, it. slight sort of like ju jump over to the guy who was hiding in, in the end zone for 10,000 years. And he was, he was basically saying like, look, I'm trying to like preserve uh, novelty for myself. Yeah. I'm, and, and he had been playing like this one shitty uh, uh, like, like 1980s uh, game. Yeah. Those tiger like arcade, those sh they were awful, but they, yeah. they were all we had. He'd, he'd been playing it for some untold amount of time. And it was like, because he wanted to save, he wanted to just like stretch out all the possible modes of entertainment for for eternity basically and i thought that was interesting because that was the one that was one of the, the times when i was like i think that i think that people would i think that real people would just sort of like live day to day like 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 you get yeah. bored with the thing and then you do something else for a while and then you can come back to that thing and it seems fresh and then multiply that by infinity years and you can just sort of continually like a little busy bee buzzing between flowers, like just keep visiting different things over and over and, mm -hmm. and they'll keep feeling fresh. Like, I really do think that's more kind of to our nature. Um, I don't know. Do you have a reaction to that thought? Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with that. Like I'm, I'm in the middle of doing this big thing where I'm replaying all the final fantasy games over and over again that I played mm -hmm. when I was a kid. And I got to say, I'm having a great time with it. it. I haven't played these games in a few years some of them and 10, 15 years for others. And it's like, I'm playing them for the first time yeah. in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, I, I also, the idea that nostalgia is such a powerful emotion for people that like, I miss the times when, but I mean, I, I think, I think that I do think the book kind of tries to confront that a little bit. I, I, I mm. love the idea, the, the wife talking about, or no, it was, I think it was the tornado woman. I can't remember any other names either, but talking about how like she forgot that she lived in an apartment mm. that like she moved into an apartment, decorated it. And then was like, you know what? Like 12,000 years ago, I lived in the same apartment. I totally yeah. forgot yeah. that. Yeah. Um, that, you're right. So, so yeah, I, 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 I wonder, like, I wonder, like, just like we have this idea of, of like, I don't know. I don't know how memory works on a scale like that right like how does yeah. how does that work like i think we can just kind of guess and say well it's like well it's just like do i remember what happened 10 years ago and extrapolate that out <laughs> but yeah. but also I, I i it's 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 fascinating so on the one hand yeah i mean i think people would just live day to day on the other i think i think the idea of eternity does change your behavior in some way like i mean i think the cool thing about that guy 
is the the person who is interviewing him does not have that same philosophy. So I think it makes it clear that this is not a philosophy shared by every single person that exists in this world. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the guy that was interviewing him wanted the answers. He wanted the answers right now. That's his whole goal is he's going to, he's basically there. He's part of the group that is walking along uh, a a latitudinal line and going to learn everything. Oh yeah. Uh, Everything there is to learn about that line. Everything there is to learn. And, and that is, I want to solve this and I'm going to do it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like he also clearly is a member of a church still, which is like religion is not something the book really like directly confronts, but there are these little bits and obviously there are some people that still believe in God. Um, but I think, I think it kind of just barely, like some people think this is heaven, but some people are still miserable. So how could it be heaven? Um, I, it doesn't like, it doesn't like spend too much time on that, but it is like an interesting idea of like, how could you believe in God with this still? Like, isn't, isn't the, the death and then the life after death, like a pretty key tenant of at least Christianity. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I, I did think that, I mean, that was another thing that, that actually worked really well for me that like, it, it's been so long and they've been, they've all just been stuck with no answers for so long that they just kind of keep on keeping on with whatever they're, right. they're most comfortable with. And, and some of them, they are most comfortable thinking like there is a God and this is not heaven, but they're just so full of like confusion because it makes no sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I do like that the story never explains what what the hell's happening. Like Me it's too. just like, yeah, one day it just happened. Like yeah. that's great. That's that's I love that. I love that kind of thing in storytelling mm-hmm. where it's like, look, it doesn't matter. That's the that's the conceit. I'm not gonna explain that. It's not important. Yeah, I was actually worried for a, a little bit that maybe the conclusion of this was gonna be unlocking that mystery, and I'm so mm-hmm. glad it, it yeah. became became apparent pretty soon that that's just not yeah. what the story was interested in doing. And I'm so so glad for it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It, it's not a it's but but it is fully interested in showing like look obviously people are confused like yeah the you know the, the space probe and, and different people are like is this the matrix is this heaven is this hell it's like yeah these are the things people would be asking and after thousands and thousands of years of no answers they just kind of be like i don't know man mm-hmm. i don't know <laughs> I, I think this is a good time maybe to kind of actually turn into talking about this thing as a instead of just the ideas that it presents, but talking about this as a physical object that exists in our world, because it it is a web serial, but it it is, it is one of those things that I think uses the format of web fiction to the best of its, its capabilities. Like Mm -hmm. we've, we've read and spent many times reading online books. Um, that is just someone publishing a bunch of words. Um, and wild Bo's pale is kind of trying to do some new things, but this is taking that concept of using it. It's, it's gifts, it's images, it's video. Um, so, so it is, it is, it is the web being used to tell a story. And that makes it very unique to me because like, this is not something you could just pick up and transpose somewhere else. It would work the same way. Yeah. Um, and I love the way it does it. Like, I mean, just the start, right? The start is so powerful like you open this thing and the text goes kind of crazy and then suddenly you're on a calendar and you just scroll you just scroll forever and every couple i think every 11 days at the start um is is just one person's dialogue and that goes on for like six years worth of calendar images um and you have no idea what's going on and it's just it's just very very attention getting right away you're like what is this what what is it what's going on here i don't understand and i just love like this is the internet this is what the internet can do for a storyteller that wants to use it this way i i agree the beginning is uh, you know as you begin to realize like okay some someone is someone needs help someone is lost and they're only able to transmit or that they're only able to speak rather every so often and then someone's trying to get in contact with them. And then I think, I don't remember what, what my reaction was the first time I read it, but I, I might have put two and two together and realized that it was, you know, speed of light restriction on mm-hmm. communication. But like just the the sort of horror of that, of like, oh my God, you're just alone for for years mm-hmm. w- w- between any kind of communication. And you can't even send a communication without using up your battery. Um yeah, I mean, we we didn't even know that this wasn't like a, a 
person. But mm-hmm. also, I mean, like this starts to get into like, well, what is a person? This thing is obviously mm-hmm. aware of its consciousness. It feels things. So, yeah, even though it like there was a moment there where I was like, oh, whew, it wasn't. A, it's not a guy. It's not a person yeah. stuck in. But I was like, well, wait a minute. Isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, once we get past the calendar, though, I mean, I think the most basic thing that I like is just the, you know, you have the three different colors and the three different sort of positions on the page mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for the three different space probes. And that's, you know, the, obviously they have a slightly different way of speaking also. And that's such a great way of separating out these characters in really the most minimalistic imaginable way. Like they, don't, yeah. they, they uh, there's like nothing else, right? There, there's no... Um, there's no more information other than what they're saying and, and the, the literal placement in color to tell you who's saying which. Yeah. And yeah. it works so well for this. It does. It is so clean and easy to understand. There is never any confusion about who is speaking. What are they like? It, it, I love it. I love it. It's just so simple and easy and uses the, the space in a wonderful way. Very mm-hmm. structurally brilliant. Um, and then interspersing with the gifts. Like I love the, the very first one when we're talking about the football game in Nebraska. Um, and like it, it'll be a little bit of dialogue, a little bit of that we're talking about. And then we'll go to a gif. We'll show here's the route that the runner is taking. Um, mm-hmm. Here's where the tornado is. Um, look, there's the goal line which happens to be um iowa or ohio i forget i don't know the states yeah um and it's like it's 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 fascinating it's also inherently absurd because it's like i don't know what map program i mean there's probably like a use of google maps a little bit right Uh, yeah i think it's some sort of like maybe google google earth plugin was was my thought yeah yeah that like shows and, and i think this is so funny because like part of me wants to say that like the reason why he had society um, completely stay still and have everything look the same as it does now is so he could use this this earth program and show <laughs> the cities uh-huh. the way they still look like part of uh-huh. me is like, yeah, totally. But then I mean, that doesn't quite make sense because he like sinks the entirety of New York City. So, yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, another thing I really liked was when when he does the YouTube videos where it's just them talking, and then it's it's a very it's very cool how it like organically connects with the dialogue you've been reading the whole time. Except now there's the element that it's actually being typed in real time, and then he can introduce. Okay, this there's a pause here. Mm-hmm. Um, this person is making a lot of typos. The space pro is making a lot of typos. Um, and it, 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 it livens it up, uh, in a way that just integrates perfectly with what you were doing already. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it just seems if you had told me before reading this, like, oh yeah, you can totally just intersperse YouTube videos with a, with a text story and it works just fine. You feel, it feels totally organic. I would have been like, no, I don't really believe you. Um, <laughs> but, but it's true. Like doing it this way, it's true because he basically keeps the same format and he just kind of uses it for like a kind of emphasis, a little bit of extra. Yeah. It's really fascinating because I like, I agree. The videos are basically just a video version of what we've been reading. It's Mm -hmm. still characters conversing with each other, interspersed with some maps and images and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the, the choices he uses like, okay, this conversation is important. This conversation has, pauses has breaks has drama in it and i really need this to happen real time i need people to experience this as it's happening i need them to see those pauses I need them to see those backspaces i need that i need the music to kind of help bring emotionality to it um really fascinating like mm-hmm. just the choices there to say yes this one has to be has to be a video um and like the the, the end is basically all all text and then the last little bit is a video like the, the goodbye video is them saying goodnight to each other. And then we interestingly zoom out of a house that's sitting on that football field. Um, uh-huh. in, the, the, in, in Denver, um, yeah, the eternal, like, like community field thing, uh-huh. which I'm not sure. Like, uh, did you, did you get anything with that? Like the choice, the choice to like end there where we like, that's where we leave as if that's where you, the reader are sitting as you kind of zoom out of the world. Um, I don't know. I found it really interesting. No, I didn't think too much about that. I, I I think maybe I just saw it as like, uh, we're, we're revisiting this place in the story and we're going to kind of look over, 
um, this this weird world that we have mm-hmm. been been living in for a couple of hours. Yeah. And uh, you know, that I mean, I mean, that's one interesting thing is if I, I I bet you know, ten years from now, if I show you a picture of that of that weird football field, you'll know you'll be like, oh yes, seventeen seven seventy six. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very you know striking image of like okay it's it's the it's the bronco stadium with with all this weird stuff in it <laughs> yeah, yeah um so it's it's just it's a, a great it's a great kind of visual touchstone for the story um is is what i would have said but but sure i mean you could be right like we do have this element that like different people are like the the space probes are like watching things so like yeah. every story that we're privy to is actually because the space probes are watching it Sure, and, sure. And some people are watching them, actually. Yeah, I mean, we even get this one point where the it's very funny where the text literally talks to us, mm-hmm. the the reader back in 2017, right? Like, yeah. uh, they make specific references to you back before everyone stopped aging. Like, it's yeah. talking to us specifically. So, yeah, yeah I mean, I, 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 do, I do wonder if, like, that was, uh, like, we were just everything we just saw, everything we just read, everything we just experienced was told through the perspective of someone sitting in a house on this football field, just existing. Um, I don't know. I, I might be reading too much into that, but we've been talking about this thing for like an hour now. And so that's what we're doing. We're reading too much into this. Yeah. That's the level we're at now. Mm-hmm. <sighs> do you, do you want to talk like the choice to be 17, 776 is an interesting one to me because of course we know 1776 that was the birth of our country um and so obviously it seems very intentional that we went with that right like this is Mm -hmm. i mean i I think it it works because it this i think this started right after july 4th so it like (laughs) like um i think like i said it went july 5th through 15th so right after Mm -hmm. independence day we started this thing called 17776 um but is there something is there something related to like, is this, is this maybe we've been being too broad and like, we're saying humans, this humans, that maybe if this is supposed to be a specific exploration of Americans. And uh-huh. so we're going to, um, you know, the same date that America was born only, um, years, thousands of years later, but th- yeah. look, they're still, um, this is, these are still Americans. Yeah. Well, they, they make the point that, this is th- that America still exists and that all the state lines are in the same places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, th- and that indeed this is like the 800th president or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and like um, the percentage of people that are president keeps going up every year because yeah. <laughs> there's only so many people. Yeah. In fact, in fact, you can't be president more than a certain number of times. So eventually they'll literally run out of people who can be president. Right. And doesn't that just strike you as hilarious? Because you would assume in this thing, the idea, the concept of term limits would probably be something that would go away when you realize that your pool of potential people is limited. Uh Uh-huh. But that's funny. They haven't even changed that. Yeah. I I guess, I mean, it's the kind of thing where maybe, maybe they will when they have to, but it's not a priority for them. Like, I think that's, I think you're onto something that like, they just don't really care about that kind of stuff. Like they, they probably all noticed and they just don't care, but their yeah. entertainment, man, don't, don't, don't mess with their entertainment. Nope. 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 Um, yeah. You know, also of course it's, it's American football, right? It's yes, American yes. football. So like, that's the most American thing about the story is it's American football. Yeah. Um, so that's the main way in which it is an American story. That's so funny because this is how, this is how Americanized my lenses that I, that, that didn't even occur to me. That was like, this is a game that only we play that like, I mean, some yeah. other countries play it like there's Canadian football. There are some countries uh, over in Asia that play a little bit. Um, we're trying to get it big in Europe, but it's not really working. There's some Latin American countries that play it. But really, this is this is America's game. Um, and and yeah, 1770, 1776 is about America, kind of. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, you, you could even take the this sort of, you know, self-obsession and, and entertainment obsession as a kind of critique of Americans mm-hmm. uh, and not just not just humans, but but Americans specifically, yeah. I mean, I mean, we've got, you know, we've got the, the fast food and the kind of, I don't know, there, there's a lot about it <laughs> that it's not like it's mercilessly ragging on Americans, but it is definitely like kind of pointing out our, um, not great <laughs> aspects. Sure, 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 sure. Um, so I guess one last question I'll ask you, um, sure. And I think this is the most interesting idea to me. 
if a person from like a thousand BC was woken up today and shown America, uh-huh. would their reaction probably be about the same as? Uh, I mean, not, obviously not the same, but but the, the the on a conceptual level, the amount of time we spend on play, the amount of time and energy we spend on entertainment, on sport, um, I, I feel like there would be a re- a similar reaction to the way that the probes react to how these people do it. Um, I think mm. one of one of the like this kind of goes back to the hierarchy of needs, right? As you advance as a society, as you improve and. And not to say we have gotten rid of problems like hunger and and things like this, but we are a society that through technological advancement has given ourselves more free time than has maybe ever existed in the history of humanity. And so we are much more driven by the need to entertain ourselves. Um, And again, this story is taking that and just extrapolating that to the extreme. And so I think if you go back a few hundred years or a few thousand years and tell people the the amount of time we spent on entertainment, which is not to say that, that, of course, entertainment's always been a key part of being a human. It's always been a key part of civilization. Definitely not saying that. But the relative amount of time we spend on it feels like it's up. Yeah, so I had a, a couple of, of thoughts actually there. Um, I think uh, I think that somebody from like 3,000 years ago might actually recognize in football, like, oh, you guys have figured out how to have warfare without killing each other. That's, that's smart. <laughs> um, because like, like it, it clearly serves that purpose on a kind of like deep psychological level where like, like we, we, we all cheer for our side and then, and then people do a kind of controlled violence, but still violence. And, uh, and then there's one winner and one loser and it's all, you know, it's all ritualized obviously, but it is a kind of, it is a kind of like ritual that we perform so that we don't have to have wars. I've heard, sure. <laughs> this is not my original take about about what uh, about what this is. By the way, this is this is a uh, this is someone else's interpretation. But I, I think they would get that. I think what what might blow their mind, though, is um, um, like like any video game, <laughs> just like you just <laughs> sit you just sit in a chair for how long, and you just stare at the screen. And so, so like when you open it up to to entertainment r- rather than just like sport competition i think their mind would be blown and they would find us to be decadent and and uh and and probably uh uh, repulsive on some level um so so yeah anyway uh, to summarize i have i I think think they might actually understand competitive sports i don't think they would understand a lot of our other uh modes of of entertaining ourselves like tv and um and games sure sure yeah i think that's fair yeah cool good question though I, i liked thinking about that um, okay. Is there anything else specifically about this you wanted to talk about? I feel like, th- like there's so much more I could talk about, honestly, but, um, I think we've really spent a, a good amount of time on it. <laughs> I feel, I feel good with our progress in, in, in talking about this. I, I guess just like, it's so good, you know, like it really is. Yeah. Um, if, if you listen through all of this and haven't read it, um, it's really one of those things where it's not that long of, of a read. It's not that big of a commitment. And, um, and it really hits hard and it really sticks with you, as you can kind of tell from this conversation. Um, I, you know, I think the, the yeah, f- final thing I'll say is what I love is it has all of these themes, but it's not like it's heavy handed in a way where it wants you to think X. And that's why we were able to have these conversations about it is like every everything that I sort of said was like oh, i don't know if this i don't know if i agree with this like the story itself sort of no like has already thought about your objection and then has one of the other characters voice that objection <laughs> so so it's not like the story is like here is the thesis and I, and I really like that i really appreciate that yeah no i agree with you i think one of the things these conversations lose for those people that are listening to us without having um consumed the work first is that like we don't talk like I, I never know what to say as far as like this was really fun and and say more than that. I think like this was a really fun read. It was very, very entertaining. It was very funny. And yeah, I think it makes me think about all these really deep, complex questions. And so when I sit down to talk about it, that's the thing I'm going to focus on. But yeah, like it's a fun read. It's a it's a breezy, quick, fun read. And I yeah. think that's one of its absolute strengths is that it can it can do this without being heavy handed, without lecturing, without 
preaching. Um, it's just like I, I think I think the John Boys is quoted as saying that first and foremost, this I wanted this to be fun, which mm-hmm. is I mean, it's that's a little irony. They're playing with the 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 themes of the story but uh-huh. um and i think that in that he succeeded 100 um yes. and, and if you can f- find a way to mix in all these deeper meanings in with your just entertaining ideas um then i think you've succeeded as a writer so mm-hmm. it's great yeah cool we did it all right let's play some football all right let's do it do 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 matt let's talk about last week's podcast a little bit so okay Last week, we did our Council of Doof episode on Mad Max Fury Road, and then we turned the vote over to you, our listeners, and you decided that Mad Max Fury Road is indeed good enough to get into our Doof canon. We actually had some questions, Matt, uh, about what that means. <laughs> yes. Um, what, what it means to be in, uh, in the Doof canon. And here's the thing. I don't know. I'm not yeah. the one that's making these choices. That's you guys. That's that's you guys. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, what we say is probably going to influence things one way or the other, but sure. um but but like, you know, the fun the fun thing for us the fun thing for us about the Doofcast actually, I would say, has been has been when we wa- when we get to watch things that we never would have watched otherwise. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. And, um, and, you know, people, people showing us weird things that, that are, that I end up loving, that I end up thinking like, wow, this has affected me. I don't know who I would be if I hadn't seen this. And like, I don't even, I can't even list all of the times that's happened on this show. So I like the idea that the canon is sort of like a collection of those weird esoteric things that are really impactful and really good, but that maybe... Maybe you've missed them somehow, or maybe maybe you think most people have missed them somehow. Yeah, um, that's that's me. Okay, I'm I'm not saying that's what the Doof Canon is. I'm saying that's my that's kind of my favorite thing about this whole process. Yeah, and um, I basically said that in the in the chat channel the other day, and um, but like that that's that's always been the most fun thing for me. So yeah, no, I I agree with that. I mean, the thing that I enjoy so much about this whole system is that like it is fully curated. Like the votes are curated by our listeners, but the, even the things that are being decided to vote on are curated by our patrons. So like it is a thing in which we're literally letting the populate, like we're not make like we're not developing a list, right? It's not like you and I sitting down and talking about like, here's what I think are some of the best things that deserve to be on our special list. Everyone else is curating this list and we're just kind of reacting to it and saying, yeah, well, I don't think it should be on that list, though. But you, if you that's that if you do, that's great. Um, and so I like that this is like this, 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 this what represents our community like this in in every way this represents the people that are part of our community whether it be our 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 community on on the patreon or whether it just be the people that download this podcast every week and listen to it this is representative of them this is your list your being all of you and and that's the thing i like the most is like i i it, this list is never going to have an end because that's impossible but even if it did like i would love for people to open up this list and say yeah like this is this is me. This is me, a member of the Doof community. I see represented in this list. Um, that's what I want it to be. Yeah. So now that Scott and I have each given two conflicting visions of what the <laughs> canon is, uh, uh, c- continue on with your day. Yeah. You decide what you want it to be and vote accordingly, and 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 that's how that's how the rule will carry. Um, we did get a, a couple people that voted no for for Mad Max Fury Road, Matt. And I, one of them was nice enough to send us a, a long message. Um, one of our newer patrons called uh, Riadder, I think Michael is his name. Um, he liked it, didn't love it. Um, not really interested in the Mad Max series as a franchise, which I don't think you were either. Um, but he, uh, he uh, his interesting his his viewing experience was interesting because he said he watched it a non HD version on a laptop with not great sound. And I'm like, yeah, this is one of those movies you need to watch on like a big TV with excellent sound in high definition or 4K if you can afford it. Or um, I, I watched it in the theaters like three times and it was such an experience. Um, 
but I mean, they didn't like the, the the thing that's fascinating. Like Michael, like ended up saying, "Yeah, it's just not like it's not like good enough, but it's still really, really good." Um, it just didn't like wow me, and so Michael chose to vote no. And I, again, like this is what I think is so cool about this thing is that like everyone's criteria is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's fine. Yeah, and it's really cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can, I I, I can. S- sympathize with not liking virtually any movie even ones that i do love so mm-hmm. um yeah that i i you know I, I do appreciate getting kind of the the minority report as it were um yeah the yeah. The, the, the reasoning f- if you if you don't like a thing that i like um because that just gives me more information about tastes which i actually find pretty valuable i find it really fascinating because i just kind of getting an understanding of why people like something and even even more interesting to me is why people don't like something, right? Like, yeah, I, I, I've gotten a pretty good handle on why I like something. I can tell you a lot why I like something. We just spent an hour talking about why we like 1770. God, I can't say it. 17776. Um, we just spent an hour talking about why we like that. But talking about why we didn't like something is so much harder. It's mm-hmm. really hard um, without being just like, that sucked. Uh, and then just like falling back into like plot hole, like, like minor gripes with things. Um, it's really easy to do that. And that's why places like CinemaSense exists. But yeah. Um, so, yeah, when I, hearing a, a well thought out, well argued position from someone on why, hey, this just didn't do it for me is always something I'm going to want to hear. So we appreciate yeah. you, uh, Michael, and, and anyone else who's done that on any of these votes in the past. We really do appreciate that. It's really fun to see, even if we disagree. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Okay, Matt. Let's talk about COVID-19 and the movie theater industry. So we haven't like checked in with what's going on in movies in a while. Um, It's been a little bit. There's not been any new ones, really. But uh, yesterday, um, actually, I think it was earlier today, AMC announced that it's going to open 450 of its U.S. locations on July 15th and the remaining 150 theaters on July 24th. Um, so AMC will be fully open. They're going to have um, like I think they're going to open at 30 percent capacity and then increase to 40 to 50. Um, and they hope to be full by Labor Day, they're saying. Or, no, okay. no. So 50 percent by Labor Day, full unrestricted capacity by Thanksgiving is what they said. Um, so they're opening. They're opening. Nope. Um, this is happening. And I, and I cannot think of a worse place to go to when there's a virus around than a dark room with a bunch of people um for two hours yeah and so i mean do do you like here's the thing amc was talking a couple weeks ago about how they're about to go bankrupt so like i get why they're doing this like you look at your balance sheet (laughs) you look at you're running out of money and you you have like i get i understand it's i think this is a bad idea i do it's just a wild place for us to be in where um, you literally, it's a choice between like, okay, do, do we behave ethically and literally, uh, just close our business? Mm-hmm. Just, just say, all right, we're bankrupt. We're literally bankrupt. This thing happened and our, our, our presumably fairly profitable business is, is gone. Um, or do you give it a go and say, look, we're just, we're just going to go, we're just going to go anyway. We know this is a bad idea and we're going to be directly <laughs> responsible for deaths. But the, the other option is we just blow up our whole, our whole business. And I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I'd like to think that I would make the right call on this, honestly, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, I understand. Like, I, I think it's, I think it's very easy for me to be sitting here in a chair saying you're going to kill people by doing this. Um, but I I'm, I don't want to I don't want to minimize a decision as a, a leader of a company that you have to make. Right. Um, because like, yeah, like if 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 we say, OK, we're not going to open until we're 100 percent sure it's going to be safe for everyone. Yeah. You could cease to exist as a company. Um, um, yeah. Well, and the other thing, like, I don't know, I, I don't necessarily think that this man, this is such a hard thing to talk about. Like, so, so, so I, I was, was talking to somebody today who, who just like their company just went through, uh, like a, a huge round of layoffs, like a, a bunch of people they, they knew and were friends with got laid off. Um, this was just today, literally today. Mm-hmm. And, um, 
and that sucks. Like all those all those people um, are now unemployed and have to go find jobs, and their families are going to experience hardship. So, like you as a leader of the company, like you're seeing all these people in front of you who you're 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 you would be you would be making them all unemployed and, and giving them a tremendous hardship, or you can spare them that and. Uh, you know, kill a bunch of people you don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, like I mean, yeah, that is the calculus here, right? Yeah. And and it's awful. And I mean, here's the question I have for you: Are you gonna feel safe going to a movie in July? Uh, no, not n- no. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm just due to life circumstances already probably taking a lot of risks that I would prefer not to take. Uh, all things being equal mm-hmm. and I'm just not going to add any extra ones. Yeah. Yeah. Me neither. I mean, look, as far as we know, Mulan is coming out July 24th. Tenet, the new Chris Nolan movie is coming out July 31st. And that's a movie I really, really want to see. And I really, really want to see that movie in theaters. And look, I miss movie theaters, man. I have been to a movie theater every week, my entire adult life, basically. And I miss them really bad. <laughs> and I sure. want to go back to the theater. But I also don't want to get sick and I don't want to get anyone I care about sick. And I, I, so I, I just I, I don't want to take that risk. And I mean, I look at things like AMC and AMC is saying that. They are not going to make people wear masks. Um, we, we've kind of more information has, has come out that says masks are effective. Masks work. They keep you from getting other people sick. Um. And they're like, I think they said because we didn't want to be drawn into a political controversy is what the CEO of AMC said, which is like the worst fucking thing you could yeah. say. Right. Um, but I mean, the, the other thing is movie theaters make their money off of fucking food sales. That's what they make their money off of. Not the ticket sales. Right. T- like more than half of the ticket sales go to the studios. It's the food. And if everyone is required to mer- wear a mask at all time, no one's going to be eating popcorn. And so they're not going to make any money. And so like, and once again, there's that calculus coming up again where they're like, well, we're just, we're strongly recommended. What they've said is in states that are in states or areas that masks are mandatory. Of course they will enforce that and they recommend them, but they recommend them just like they recommend you turn your fucking cell phone off. And I don't know if you've been to an AMC lately, but they don't enforce (laughs) that shit at all. (laughs) Uh huh. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, none of this. It's all it's all pretty predictable and, mm-hmm. and sad. Um, I'm not going to be going to the theaters unless no. I like take antibody tests and it comes back positive or something. Sure, sure. But uh, or you know, I I don't know. We're we're still so far off from the vaccine. Like you you want you want to just be able to say like, no, guys, look, this is simple. Just just hold it down until the vaccine comes out and then we can open everything up and then I'll be fine. And the problem is like, it's just, it's just too long. It's just, it's yeah. going to take too long. E- even is, the most yeah. optimistic uh, expectation. Um, so many things are going to go out of business. I mean, I think, I think theaters might not survive even if they do reopen to full capacity because. Right. Like I don't, I don't like even running at 30% capacity for the two movies that are coming out at the end of this month, I don't know how they make enough money to make it worth it. Like, yeah, I mean, they're losing a shit ton of money right now because they own all these giant theaters on these giant pieces of land, the leases of which I'm sure are just insane. Yeah. Um, but they're not having to pay any of their employees right now because they furloughed all their employees. So they're going to have to bring, they're going to have to start paying labor costs again. Um, they're going to have to start paying inventory costs again. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't, I I don't know. Obviously someone in the company has done the calculus and said that they think that they could run profitably off of 30% admission. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I figure, I figure they'll just, only staff about 30% of the staff though. You know? Sure, 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 um, sure. But, but like you said, you can't scale back the physical plant, you know, the, the giant, the giant building that you paid mm-hmm. for. Um, that is, that is going to be a, a, assuming, assuming they're actually leasing those, which I can't imagine they'd be doing anything else. Um, yeah. I'd be very surprised if they owned that, that property. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. So um, that's, that's going to be where they're eating shit right now. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Like, I, I, I think we're on the same page here. Where we're just like, we're not going to theaters. We think this is a bad idea. But I also understand why 
the leaders of these companies are like, shit, we got to do something, man. <laughs> we're mm-hmm. going to die. Um, we're going to die as an organization. Do we die as an organization or do we kill people? <laughs> I think that's yeah. the best way. Uh, and it's such, oh, it's, it sucks. Right. It sucks. Right. It's, it's funny because I, I know what I just said sounds like I'm like equivocating killing people and, and not shutting down your company. It, it's more that I was trying to establish the idea that like, it's really hard to, it's really hard to actually be the guy who fires people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't, I, I've, n- I've never had to fire someone in my life and yeah. I, I hope I never have to do it. Um, yeah. But I can't. I mean, I, yeah. I never have either. And I would consider it like a, a kind of personal success if I managed to never have to like, yeah. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, yeah, I, th- I think that's a good thing to say. We are we are not equivocating losing a business with losing life. Obviously, li- lives are worse. I think that's mm-hmm. that's a very obvious, transparent decision. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, they the person that has has to actually make that decision and then live with the consequences on his side, which are right. looking in people's eyes and, and telling them, "Sorry, you're yeah, yeah." And plus, you know, you're you're sort of you know you're 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 sort of taking away their insurance by doing that. You're, mm-hmm. you're, you're hurting them in more in, in ways that have a magnitude, not on the order of a death, but it's, you know, that it adds up. I don't know. Yeah. It's complicated, man. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm so mad that this is that like, that has to be a calculus any, like in yeah. general, right? Like yeah. it just pisses me off that these, like that, that someone has to, there's someone has to sit in a building and weigh these options. It just seems like, yeah. It's, it seems broken. Yeah, they're, they're they're like I just I just wanted to I was really good at at managing inventory at my local <laughs> at my local theater and they promoted me and now oh my God. now I have yeah. to decide if I want to kill people or fire people. Yeah. Oh, well. Obviously, fire people. Obviously, <laughs> but but can you do the firing for me? Right. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a I think it's a terrible idea. I think if. No one's wearing a mask, man. I complained about this on one of my other shows earlier. Nobody in Texas is wearing masks anymore. And it's just like I'm watching the numbers tick up again. And oh, I'm just man. like, oh, God, now we're going to open theaters again. And no, everyone's going to go to movie theaters. And none of them are going to be wearing masks. And while the air filtration systems on, like, airplanes are supposed to be really good, I don't trust a movie theater. I don't. Uh. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> no, it's just it's just a big, giant room. There's, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have that much circulation. Yeah. Well, people in Colorado are still doing pretty well about masks, I would say. That's but, good. Um, That's good. But uh, I mean, I mean, uh, I, I think maybe maybe Texas is just leading the curve, unfortunately, in in getting yeah. bored of that. It. I mean, it was one of the first states to open up again, so mm-hmm. it is. It is. And you know, our governor the other day was like, um, "Hey, young people, you need to take this stuff more seriously." And we're like, "Well, you opened up, mm-hmm. like that. You're sending mixed messages there, buddy." Yeah. Um, not that, not that it's not the responsibility of all these people to wear masks, but like, just, I wish the government would just say, Hey, you have to, (laughs) um, right. Right. Yeah. Anyway, enough about masks. I, 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 it's so, it's such a weird, it's such a weird time to be talking about the movie industry right now. Um, and I, I can't, I can't imagine someone going to the theater. Like I just can't, I know some people are going to do it, but I would be very surprised if anyone I knew walked into a movie theater in july i just it, i just can't imagine right now i'm just i don't know i think i think i don't know man i, I think that a lot of people are going to do it <laughs> <laughs> um but may, but still maybe not enough to keep the theaters afloat i don't know we, we do love our entertainment as we learned today that's i wanted to make that connection yeah i mean it's very very difficult to tell people they can't uh you know, like gyms are opening up and people are going to the gyms and, mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and they're, they're opening up at like partial capacity, but you, you kind of, you normalize it, you boil the frog and, and so, soon enough you're working out in a room full of people and you're like, Hey, hold on, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. oh well. Hooray. Yep. All right. Well, hopefully, um, things don't get worse. What a great note to end our podcast. <laughs> yeah. D- uh, wear masks, everyone. Wear masks. Be safe. Stay healthy. Please wear masks. Yes. And that is all we had for you guys this week. If you have any opinions on anything we talked about on 17776, on 
uh, the Doof Cannon and Mad Max Fury Road or on theaters opening up again. Are you going to go back to the theater, listener? Are you going to go in July? What about August? When when would you feel comfortable walking into a movie theater? That's a question I haven't asked myself yet, and I don't know the answer to it. Uh, let us know, though. You can reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com or on our Twitter account at doofmedia. Yeah, and if you're not already subscribed to this podcast, we encourage you to do so and ensure you never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. And you can find this and all of our other shows over at doofmedia.com. If you like what we do here and want to support us, consider becoming a patron of Doof Media. Head on over to patreon.com slash doofmedia and pledge a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford to help ensure we keep growing, keep making new content, and keep going to the movies. I mean, wait, not going to the movies, not going to the movies. <laughs> this episode only exists thanks to the wonderful generosity of our patron, Josh. Josh, thank you so much for uh, for helping us, for um, being a part of this community and for recommending this read to me. It was a very, very powerful read. I, I really loved 17776. So thank you so much. I would not have read this thing ever without you. So we really appreciate it. And I was really glad of the opportunity to talk about it, even though I had read it. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Also, please consider rating and reviewing us on Apple podcasts. Every review helps us get more exposure and introduces new people to the content that we make here. All right, folks, we will see you back here next week for another episode of our deconstructing director series. This week, we'll be talking about David Fincher's the girl with the dragon tattoo, a movie I've never seen. Can't wait. <laughs> And you'll do what I say. Woof, woof. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say. Woof.